So everyone, I'm Anita Haberman. I'm president and CEO of the Surrey Board of Trade. And thank you so much for attending today's press conference at the Surrey Board of Trade in partnership with the BC Salmon Farmers Association. I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of our Coast Salish people, specifically the Kwantlen, Cape Sea, Semiami, Tawasin, Kaykut, Coquitlam, Inuit, and Métis peoples. They have a profound connection to the land and water that surrounds our great city of Surrey. The Surrey Board of Trade, everyone, is Surrey City Building Business Organization. And we're very pleased today to uh, really announce something that is dire to Surrey's economy that compromises Indigenous reconciliation. It compromises Surrey's economic development. And you may not think that what happens on Vancouver Island or in northern British Columbia matters to an urban center such as Surrey, but it really does. There is a connection between our urban communities and our rural communities. So before I get into the actual announcements that we're going to make, I do want to uh, articulate that we have several BC Salmon Farmer Association members in attendance. They are, and, and many of them are Surrey-based businesses. They are Scredding, Aqua Pack and Air Foam Group, Aqua Trans Distributors, Taplo Fields, West Coast Reductions, Kanetsu World Express Canada, Innovacia, Cargill Aqua Nutrition Canada, and Moe Canada West. All of these companies have had profound economic impacts to their businesses as a result of the Canadian government's decision to close or move to closing salmon farming on the Discovery Islands. There has been no rational approach in terms of Minister Joyce Murray. The, you know, really, the Surrey Board of Trade is so disappointed with the Canadian government without a rational pathway for the significant closure of current salmon farms, not including the recent 40% reductions we have already experienced as part of her transition plan. It is being presented as very much as her concession, a reasonable and fair approach considering both sides of the argument. However, if her plan proceeds, this will be catastrophic to the industry. It will effectively close the sector. It will effectively reduce jobs significantly within British Columbia and today more specifically within Surrey. This is, ladies and gentlemen, the aqua culture industry. It is about true indigenous reconciliation as tomorrow we move in the month of June towards indigenous recognition month and a movement towards a journey around economic reconciliation. The Canadian government's decision to close salmon farms compromises indigenous reconciliation. It compromises Surrey's economic development Aquaculture supports 20,000 Canadians and their families for jobs and their economic livelihood, producing millions of high-quality, nutritious, and sustainable protein meals for millions in Canada and around the world. And we're also talking about food security, food sustainability. So to tell you more about the economic impacts within British Columbia, within Surrey, I wanted to introduce uh, some specific speakers that are going to speak to different elements of what it is that we're saying in terms of the Canadian government's decision compromising Indigenous reconciliation and Surrey's economic development. Please help me welcome, first of all, Brian Kingzet. He's the Executive Director of the BC Salmon Farmers Association. Thank <laughs> you.
Thank you, Anita. I'm very privileged to be here um, with our Surrey members. Um, so I, as Anita said, I represent the BC Salmon Farmers Association, and most people know us as the producers, the people on the central coast of British Columbia and northern Vancouver Island, where the majority of salmon farms are located. We are very proud as, as a group to be producing high quality food in a sustainable way, and we're very proud of the reconciliation that our sector has been doing as an agricultural commodity uh, with First Nations. We now put more than $50 million in direct uh, economic impacts into First Nations, and all our farms are located in agreements with First Nation partners. So that's our production side, where we're based on Campbell River North and uh, as far north as Clem II and the Kittisu Hey Hey territory. But what we're here today to talk about is the impacts that we actually have in urban areas all across British Columbia, but especially in Surrey. So here in Surrey, we uh, ref we are responsible for over about $200 million um, in economic activity. As a sector, we have gone from 2020, when we were producing $1.6 billion in economic activity in British Columbia uh, and employing over 6,500 people, to losses in the Discovery Islands, and now what we're worried about with the Minister M Joyce Murray's transition process about losing the sector altogether. We are BC's largest agricultural export. To date, we have lost more than 20 million meal portions per year out of production. The, that started in 2020 when the minister made a decision to close farms in an area called the Discovery Islands um, and went against um, the recommendations of the Cohen Commission and 10 federal Canadian Science Advisory Secretariat science reports that said that the BC salmon farming industry had less than minimal risk to wild salmon. But our current minister is, is not following her department's science, and we have been committed to a transition process to further limit our intera interactions with wild salmon. We are very much in, uh, prepared to rise to the challenge of that and to, and to show that we continue to have a less than minimal risk and to further um, uh, create more trust and transparency around the science. But during that time, we are looking for the business certainty to be able to continue our operations, to be able to make those significant investments, innovation with our First Nation partners. But today, what we want to talk about is the impacts that that has here in Surrey, where a majority of our suppliers are located um, in the trucking, equipment, feed, uh, and innovation side. Um, so with that, I'll pass that, I'll pass the agen agenda back to Anita and we'll uh, look forward to further discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Our next speaker, please help me welcome Brad Hicks, director of Tableau Fields. Uh, thank you and good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm just going to do a little quick background on myself so you get some bearings of why I'm going to say what I'm going to say. Uh, I'm a veterinarian specializing in fish diseases and a businessman. I joined the salmon farming industry in British Columbia in 1988. I was responsible for actually putting in many of the original farms, including in the Discovery Islands, the northwest coast of, of Vancouver Island, in Tofino. In addition, I was responsible for putting in the first land-based recirculation aquaculture system uh, on Vancouver Island in the mid-1990s, and we also uh, installed a number of the initial salmon farms in Chile. I actually became a salmon farmer to revitalize coastal communities, to bring strong, resilient to the people living and working in coastal communities. Prior to salmon farming, most coastal communities were reliant on cyclical industries which were not resilient and very hard on families. Salmon farming brought stability, lifelong working opportunities for people born on the coast to grow up and develop well-paying, rewarding careers while still living in coastal communities. Salmon farming offered multi-generational jobs for people wanting to produce food, live by the ocean, and stay with families. Salmon farming provided an opportunity for communities as well. 
Salmon farming also fuels opportunities for people doing business in the Lower Mainland. The small company I am party, part of has a local cannery in Surrey and Port Cowles and a feed mill in Chilliwack. In Surrey alone, there are over 300 full-time jobs in salmon farming. In the Lower Mainland, there are approximately 1,000 additional jobs associated with salmon farming. Salmon farming offers a successful opportunity on the coast. The physical, financial, and educational infrastructure has been developed during the last 40 years. The industry, in turn, has invested heavily in communities and human resources. The social and economic well-being of community is based on jobs. Jobs are the foundation of prosperity and family strength and unity. Without jobs, communities quickly lose their people, their tax base, they disintegrate into poverty and eventually into oblivion. Now the Minister of Fisheries and Ocean wants to destroy all these coastal communities based on the full, false assumption that removing salmon farms will increase the number of wild salmon. I actually kind of refer to her as Lady Macbeth sometimes. <clears throat> there is absolutely no scientific or other evidence to support her thesis that wild salmon will increase by the removal of salmon farms. Likewise, the human suffering brought on by shutting down these farms will be devastating. The fisheries minister is more interested in parroting soothsayers than serious scientists. Soothsayers also have their work published in reviewed journals. We need some leadership in Ottawa that can separate the wheat from the shaft, the useful from the useless. The minister references the Cologne Committee supporting her thesis that fish farms are a threat to wild salmon. The Cologne Commission published in 2012 was a public inquiry into the declining numbers of sockeye salmon returning to the Fraser River. In referencing salmon farming, Cologne explicitly commented there was no smoking gun. In the intervening 10 years and with millions of dollars <coughs> expensed on, on investigating salmon farming, the smoking gun is still elusive. The published scientific literature and the Canadian Science for Advisory Secretariat affirms there is no smoking gun. Yet, based on highly speculative conjecture, the minister is ready to lynch the salmon farming industry and the coastal communities which have economic and social benefits of salmon farming, the foundation of their well-being. Currently, the minister is acting like Attila the Hun. She is using the precautionary approach as a blunt political instrument to bludgeon coastal communities in British Columbia. There is no scientific rationale supporting the removal of salmon farms to increase wild salmon. The precautionary approach needs to be used much more cautiously. Message to the minister. This thing you are doing is evil. It is unfounded. It is callous. It is uncaring. And it will not end well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brad. Our next speaker, please help me welcome Kieran Clark, Operations Manager for Aqua Trans Distributions. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the BC Salmon Farmers Association and the Surrey Board of Trade for allowing me to say a few remarks today. Although it's disappointing while we're all here today, it's encouraging to see other industry leaders and partners and I'm hoping that today our voice can be heard as a collective. I'd like to start by sharing a story from one of our managing partners who unfortunately isn't able to be here today. Being a successful small business owner is one of the most rewarding yet difficult things that any individual can do. Navigating the challenges 
of staffing, market acquisition, regulatory requirements, vendor management, the list goes on. All while building a legacy and trying to support a family comes with continuous and significant sacrifice. All of these pressures were intensified during the global pandemic, where we, our industry, both aquaculture and transportation, were deemed as an essential business. We pushed our business and our people in order to continue to provide that essential service and put food on the shelves of grocery stores when, at, when they were at their highest level of depletion. And what response did we receive from the Canadian government? While your service may have been essential yesterday, today we are looking at closing 40% or more of your industry, an essential industry. And we knew we would have to contend as a small business. We would have to contend with other businesses. We would have to contend with the labor market and hire the right people. We would have to contend to provide unique value to our customers. But the one thing as a small Canadian business we never thought we would have to contend with was the Canadian government itself. And for myself, I've grown up and spent my whole life in the greater Vancouver area. Port Coquitlam and now Surrey is my home. I did, however, spend four years in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, getting my degree in operations and supply chain management. And the one thing that I knew for certain was that upon completion of my degree, I wanted to come home to Vancouver, to a city I was proud of, to a city I loved, and that I wanted to contribute towards positively. And I knew in order to do that, I had to find an industry that would reflect the values of my own, sustainability, community, innovation. I landed in aquaculture and transportation. And over the past five and a half years, I've spent my time, effort, and resources learning the industry, building, growing, maintaining relationships with many of those who are in the room and countless others who are not. But throughout that time, um, it's now very disheartening to myself that everything that I've worked for and that I've tried to achieve is now in the hands of the Canadian government. And as a young Canadian professional, it's very discouraging. Now, my story is not unique. There's thousands of others who face a very similar impact that work in this industry. And my focus is on young Canadian professionals. On my team alone, there's 11 other individuals under the age of 30 who, all f are, who are all in jeopardy now of having their careers and their futures erased because of the government. Everything that I was so eager and so excited to come home for and contribute may now all be gone. Now the full scope of further closures to BC's economy cannot fully be understood at this time. But we do have a few notes. Hundreds of vendors will be impacted, BC vendors. Among those, BC ferries, who may lose hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars of annual revenue. Supply chain discrepancy for Vancouver Island and a straight net loss of jobs. A reduction in reciprocal supply chain to remote communities, such as Clem 2 and Coal Harbor, amongst many others, where cost of goods will significantly increase. A lack of organic growth within the industry means cannibalization of other BC businesses. And tens of millions of dollars of lost payments and taxes to BC business. It's important to note that the impact of further closures is not just to the producers, it's to all of the vendors and the vendors of those vendors. So we're asking on behalf of our families, our employees, and the thousands of others who are impacted to stop the further closure of salmon farms. Instead, invest in innovation and maturity of the industry. Provide us with a realistic runway to transition that focuses on the preservation as well as not pushing the industry below critical mass. We hope that you can understand that the impact is not just to those with families and who have been working in the industry for many years, but it's also for the future of Canada and for those like myself who are hoping for a better future. Thank you for your time, and I hope that these words will inspire some thought. Thank you. And our final speaker is Josh Plamondon. He's the CEO of Aquapack and Air Foam Group. Let's give a warm welcome to Josh. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks uh, to Anita, the Surrey Board of Trade, and our partners at the Salmon Farmers for allowing me to say a few words. Uh, my name is Josh Plamondon, and I'm the CEO of Aquapack Industries. We are uh, a small business based here in Surrey, BC. Aquapack was founded in 1986, and its founding story 
has roots in aquaculture. One of our founders had invested in an early fish farm, and his neighbor and future partner set out to manufacture packaging to help get that fish to market. Since then, our business has grown. Our group of businesses now spans four locations and provides solutions in both packaging and in construction products across North America. Our packaging business has become synonymous on the West Coast for providing high-performance packaging used to ship fresh food, and sometimes alive, around the world. All of this growth and success is will only, was only made possible with the opportunity that aquaculture provided our business some 37 years ago. To this day, we are still an integrated partner in the industry. Our packaging products make it possible to feed millions of Canadians with fresh salmon right across the country. The processing facilities where the salmon is processed are built with insulated panels made in our factories. Their barges, docks, and farm sites utilize our flotation billets. In short, this industry is a vital and integral part of our business. For perspective, in 2021, seafood made up 44% of our total business in North America, with BC Aquaculture contributing 22% of our total sales and 50% of our salmon or our seafood sector. In 2022, seafood was 43% of total sales, and BC Aquaculture represented 23% of that, or a 54% share of that segment. In 2023, we are seeing the impacts from the Discovery Island closures. This year has seen aquaculture share fall to 12% of our overall sales and 27% of seafood. It's a 50% reduction. Our Campbell River facility experienced a shutdown and layoff for the first quarter. That's the first time in my 17 year career that we had to do that and those conversations weren't easy. Interestingly, our processor customers in the Lower Mainland, who would often buy and process local BC salmon for retail applications, are still consuming packaging at the same rate as prior years. years year to date, seafood is still 43% of our revenue. As part of the service to these customers, we offer a recycling program. So we see where the packaging that they're buying their fish from and where it comes from. Uh, they're simply buying fish from other parts of the world rather than selecting locally farmed salmon, which is no longer available. The demand for seafood hasn't changed, but the source of it locally has already shifted. Further closures of the industry is only going to continue this trend. You will still see farmed salmon at the local gr grocery store. It will be raised halfway around the world and will cost twice as much. In a time of high inflation, especially in our food supply chain, this will only hurt Canadians further. Not to mention the environmental impacts from transport and impacts to the local communities and First Nations who rely on this industry. The consumer will still get their food, but the local communities who could be thriving are going to suffer without jobs and any form of economy to prosper. The business community is focusing more and more on ESG, environmental, social, and governance. The way the federal government has handled this file, especially the Department of Fisheries, I would give them a failing grade on all of these metrics. They are not listening to their own scientists that the industry is best in class at managing their environmental impacts. They are ignoring the rural communities and First Nations where the industry operates and are turning their back on an industry that is leading the world in compliance and third-party certifications and, a, and have the skill and talent to achieve the improvement objectives that they have set out. For our business, we want to be part of the solution. Our people are passionate about being part of the food supply chain, and we're working really hard on innovation around packaging to make it more sustainable. The aquaculture industry is an important partner in this equation, but the government needs to stop playing politics with this industry and let science guide the decision-making process. We are here to stand beside our partners and let our voices be heard. We are an important member of the aquaculture community and the business community here in Surrey. And we won't stand by and let special interest groups control the narrative. Thank you again for your time. If I could ask all speakers to join me for any questions that media have. So while they're uh, coming up, I just wanted to preface that the direct economic benefits operated by these companies in Surrey before the federal government's decision to shut down salmon farming operations in the Discovery Islands have amounted to $220 million in annual revenue, $46 million in GDP, 
344 full-time jobs, that's right, right here in Surrey. $24 million in annual salaries. This cannot be ignored. So any questions from the media, please direct your question to who you want to respond to that question. Please. Yes, yeah, so we're waiting on guidance from the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans. Uh, we have been in a transition process that we had a series of steps. The Minister has gone off that process. We expected, we just received a what we heard document that was originally expected in February. We were anticipating a six week consultation period. Uh, we have heard um, some rumor that the Minister plans to go ahead with her framework. Uh, we have been asking for a delay uh, so that we can, um, First Nations can be more properly consulted and so we can talk more about the innovation. So we are at a bit of a, a point right now where as a sector, we're not really sure what the federal government's intentions are, but we know that we're, that the minister wants to put some sort of a framework in uh, sooner than later uh, without proper consultation. Yeah, there is absolutely uh, opportunities. We know that the original mandate that was suggested was that we would all move the, the sector over to land. And we know that if we do that, we will lose the industry from British Columbia because uh, on Vancouver Island, uh, we're too far away from markets. We don't have an adequate power or the adequate, um, uh, the adequate amount of land. And we also, the business of uh, land-based culture is not, is not fully proven yet. And we can look at large international experiences, but we know that if it does become viable, it will not happen in BC. We rely on Northern Vancouver Island and the Central Coast for the unique oceanography that that provides for producing very high quality salmon. What that mandate has switched to is limiting our interaction with wild salmon and, and providing more confidence around the science. And that is a challenge that the sector has been completely prepared to speak up to and we and invest in. And that will take billions of dollars in investment, but we need the business certainty that, we, the, the, uh, that the industry is able to continue. And we've already taken a 40% reduction in the sector, and so the viability of the sector as a business as a whole is now in jeopardy. And any further cuts could be the end of the sector. We are hearing a rumor that, that, that a, sim, a decision may be coming. Uh, but we have yet to see an announcement from the Minister on that. Um, we are certainly hoping for that, but we have not had, as of right now, we have not had official communication from the Minister's office that that is going to be happening. But we are, we have been asking for delay. Our First Nation partners have been asking for delay so that they might have proper consultation, but we have not, as of right now, had that announcement from the Minister. Uh, we hope that any more time will allow us to have uh, more due diligence around the, the discussion and, uh, and for the First Nations and the sector and our sector partners uh, to try and uh, explain to this, this fisheries minister about the sustainability of the industry and that we are prepared to speak up to this challenge and that the industry does not need to be shut down. Any other questions? So the closures to date, um, so in 2020, we produced about $1.6 billion in economic activity in British Columbia. That the Discovery Islands decision, which was 24% of the industry, uh, our analysis of that has shown that that has resulted in about 1,500 jobs lost already, about 20 million meals annually off Canadian uh, and U.S. Uh, seafood plates. Uh, and $400 million in economic activity and of course the associated impacts to all our suppliers. So already the, the, the decisions and that first decision was overturned on, um, by a federal judge and now that, that is, decision is being questioned again because the current fisheries minister does not appear to have followed her own procedures in that either. So we're questioning that, that decision. But it's already had significant impacts on the sector and any other impacts are going to be very severe. Any other questions? Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. We do have a media kit uh, and an attendee kit. I just ask you all 
to be ambassadors for the salmon farming aquaculture industry, not only for Surrey, not only for British Columbia, but for all of Canada. Thank you so much.